Congresswoman Barbara Lee is a 20 year, this is your 20th year, I believe, serving this district unapologetically, amen. She, you, you know, you know when, when, when her tagline is Barbara speaks for me, amen. That's, that's a, a mighty, mighty, mighty tagline. And, and I'm just so blessed that uh, she was able to carve out time in her schedule to come and spend a few moments with us this morning. So come on, everybody, let's stand to our feet. Let's welcome Congresswoman Barbara Lee to the stage as she comes. Come on, y'all, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, let's thank God for her. Let's have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. So again, we, we are so honored to have you here and uh, you know, you're, you're busy representing and fighting for us in, in Washington, D.C. But most people uh, may not know some of your story of just uh, where you're from, how you ended up in public service. And uh, so I'd love for folks just to get a quick window into um, who you are and, and, and what brings you into the life of public service in this your 20th year. Well, first, uh, Pastor Mike, I have to uh, thank you for not only inviting me to be here with you today, but for your spirit-filled and bold leadership in our community and throughout the country. <laughs> Believe me, he's well known in Washington, D.C. I ran into several members who worked for you <laughs> on the East Coast. I just got back late last night. But uh, it's so important that um, all of you, the way, show the way in this community. And seeing our young people here today it makes me feel that uh, our, our future is secure. And it's up to us to make sure that they do become those leaders, not only of this district and of this community, but leaders of the world. Because we are truly global citizens. And these young people can turn the world around. So it's exciting to be here with you. And I'll just begin with uh, my story early on. I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. And that's a border town right next to Sweet Ida Juarez. And so I was, and the uh, black community in El Paso still is only about 3%. Then when I was growing up, it was 2%. And so we lived in an African American and Latino community. I started school when schools were segregated. And so believe you me, I remember the day when African Americans could not go to public schools. Mm. Okay, and that's why it's so important that we don't allow Betsy DeVos in this administration to take us back to those days, because I remember those days of segregation very well. My family was very active. My mother was one of the first, my late mother, who some of you may have known, she passed away three years ago. She was one of the first 12 students to integrate the University of Texas at El Paso. Wow, wow. wow. The first, wow. one of the first 12. That's a, that's a rich legacy. That's a big deal. El Paso was the first city in Texas to integrate public wow. facilities. My grandfather uh, had his degree from Houston Tillotson College, was born in Galveston, but somehow migrated to El Paso, and he became the first African-American letter carrier in El Paso, Texas, and spoke fluent Spanish. Wow. Wow. Papa, we called him, W.C. Parrish. He was a member and a deacon and a member of the Board of Trustees and a deacon at, the, uh, at Visitors Chapel AME Church. Mm. My mother was a member of the United Methodist Church and my grandmother was a member of the Baptist Church. Wow. He was drinking from all them streets. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> but because they were so active, and my dad was in the military. He was an army officer at Fort Bliss, Texas. Mm. Now, because of segregation, my mother and father and grandparents refused anymore to participate in any segregated efforts, such as sending us to a segregated school, even though Douglas School in El Paso was the black school and was the best school. But they said no more segregation. So they ended up no more participation in anything that was about segregation. So we ended up going to Catholic school. So here I had every day going to mass. I spoke fluent Latin. There were two students in that Catholic school for eight years who were black, my sister and myself. Wow. So you can imagine negotiating those nuns. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but as I look back, it was the Sisters of Loretta, that order of nuns. If you don't know who they are, 
they're a, a, an order of nuns who really are on the front lines in the Catholic Church for fighting for social and economic justice Amen. and for peace. Amen. That's their mission. And I didn't know that as I was growing up, but only recently did I learn more about the order of nuns and gotten to know them as an adult. Mm. So this was my life, going to mass every day, reading the catechism, fighting back against segregation, uh, and even in the school books, there was nothing about black history or African American history. And when the word slavery was used, it was in a very negative, of course, sense about the people. And every student in the classroom would look at myself and my sister mm -hmm. when, you know, and, and kind of hiss, you know. So, I mean, it, it was that kind of a childhood. But I had to break many glass ceilings as a student, young student in El Paso, Texas, because of that. I was on the drill team. and. You know, I was on the tennis team, and I, you know, I just said, I'm going to do it. I played fluent. I played the piano. I was in all the concerts, oh, and, amazing. you know, all that. I mean, I was, got, <laughs> oh, no. I, I haven't even opened, no. I did when my grandkids were here two weeks ago. I have, oh, when wow. I graduated from high school, I won three music scholarships. Wow. I'm a Congress, concert you pianist. You a renaissance I won in woman. the day. <laughs> that's, but that's because my mother and father and grandfather they, they made us, they insisted that we do everything because they said you're as good as and as smart as anybody else mm -hmm. at your school mm -hmm. and in this community. And because of that, we're going to sacrifice. You go take piano lessons, you go take ballet lessons, mm -hmm. you go be part of the Girl Scouts, you go be part of the drill team, you go take, you go learn how to sew. <laughs> everything. <laughs> So they sacrificed to provide for their three daughters all of these extracurricular mm -hmm. activities as well as paying that tuition at St. Joseph's Elementary School. Now you, you ended up coming to this area and uh, we were having a conversation about the legacy of uh, your, one of your, I guess your mentor who just recently passed, Ron Dellums, who, who you served with for many years. And I, that, I think that is, was kind of the start into some of your public service perhaps here in the area or? In the area, but let me just go back to San Fernando. We moved okay. to Southern California when I was 13. And uh, that was when I was in junior high and on to high school. And I wanted to be a cheerleader at San Fernando High School. The, I didn't look like what they wanted cheerleaders to look like. I wasn't blind and I didn't have blue eyes. Hmm. And they had a small selection committee to select cheerleaders. Never had they had an African-American cheerleader mm -hmm. or a Latino or an Asian Pacific American cheerleader. And so I went to the NAACP. By then, I was on work study. I was working four and five days a week to help my mother. So I was working four hours, I think three or four hours and going to school. And the president of the credit union where I was working was the president of the NAACP. So I went to John Mance, our beloved Southern California and passed away a few years ago. I said, John, I want to be a cheerleader at San Fernando High, but I, I can't break through this. So John Mance and the NAACP, they worked with me. We fought that school, and that school, we made them change the rules. Now, this was with the NAACP here. I'm 14 years old. That's your name. Organizing, okay, at 14. We made them change the rules of the game so that the student body could select and vote on who they wanted to be cheerleaders. Mm, at 14. Right? At 14. I turned 15 by the time we finished all this, but I was in the ninth grade. And so, okay, finally I was able to try out. So I did my thing. I tried out in front of the student body. Guess what? I won. I was the first black cheerleader at San Fernando High School. Okay, so that was really the beginning. Okay? But also that year, an Asian Pacific American, a Japanese American girl won, Ooh. Jeannie Tanaka, yeah. because of that. Okay? It's like when you open up doors, it's for everybody. And you've got to open it for everybody, because I was determined that it was not going to be just for me, because I went around to all the girls of color. I said, look, you've got to try out. You've got to try out. Here's our chance. You've got to try out. And there were very few black girls there, so it was mostly Latinas and, and Asian Pacific American girls. I said, you've got to try out. Mm -hmm. and that's what happened. Okay, so I come to the Bay Area. A lot of personal uh, trauma, a lot of, a lot of problems, a lot of issues like so many young women have. I was a teen mother. Mm. I um, have two phenomenal sons, got divorced, remarried, went through all the issues that we 
many women still go through. Mm. Uh, and I found myself just kind of out there. So I um, was determined that I was gonna take care of these kids and go to college. So I went on welfare for four years. Mm. Food stamps, Medi-Cal, public assistance. Wow. Got into Mills College. Yes. Touch your okay. Got into Mills College. Shout out to all the Mills women in the house. Yeah. Latifah, Latifah, I ended up teaching a the class there. Latifah is an unbelievable, brilliant sister who was in my class and she's making me so proud. Yeah. <laughs> so, my, my mother is a Mills woman as well. She went is she Mills. really? Mm -hmm. Well, Mills women, something about Mills. Y'all all right, y'all all know? right. But because of Mills, I was able, because I couldn't afford childcare and the child daycare centers were full. And even if I could afford it, I couldn't uh, get them in because of the long wait list. So they went with me to school. I picked them up and they'd hang out at Mills with me. And thank God the students and the professors understood what yeah. I was going through and let my kids just hang out there. And so finally, during the Shirley Chisholm campaign, I had a course in Mills College and was asked, uh, part of the course requirements, Latifah knows, we had to do field work. And the course requirement in my first and only government class I've ever taken was to do field work in a political campaign. Then in the day it was McGovern, Muskie, and Humphrey. I said, no, flunk me. I ain't working in any of those camps. I'm not working in any of them. No. And y'all Google why. Touch your neighbor. You just Google why. Yeah. So I became president of the Black Student Union at Mills. And that yes. was during the Black Panther days. And, yes. Okay. And Wakanda forever, right? And I was a... <laughs> I was a community yeah. worker with the Black Panther yeah. Party. <laughs> Wakanda forever. That's right. Yeah. So I became a community worker, worked with Bobby Seale, Elaine Brown, and yes. Huey Newton. Yes. I was Bobby Seale's fundraising coordinator yes. on his campaign when he yes. ran for mayor of Oakland. Yes. Bobby paved the way for the first African-American mayor to be elected. Bobby almost won. Mm. I uh, bagged groceries. My kids helped me sell newspapers with the Black Panther Party. I helped Huey Newton. I edited his book, Revolutionary Suicide. He wow. thanked me in the beginning of the wow. book for it. Wow. Okay. On, How many of y'all knew all this about? This is amazing. It's amazing. Remember, I was not a party member, which was to my advantage because I was able to work on the outside mobilizing yeah. non-party members to support the party. Mm. We brought Huey Newton to Mills College, had a book signing there. Mm. <laughs> we did a lot. Elaine Brown became a student at Mills College during her campaign. I was working in the administration office as, mm. as an intern, letting in certain students, yeah. <laughs> making yeah. recommendations. Yeah. So, <laughs> Yes. Okay. So I always knew who I was and right. what my job was and my responsibility as an African American woman. Yes. Yes. Regardless of that. So Shirley Chisholm came. I invited her because she was the first African American woman elected to Congress. Wow. And so during this time, How many from Brooklyn. Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm. From Chism. Brooklyn. Okay. First African American woman. I don't know how she, given what I'm dealing with today, I don't know how she dealt with this stuff. Boy. But Shirley came and I invited her to come to Mills College and she came and she spoke and she said she was running for president. Wow. I said, what? The media, of course, had not covered that. So I went up afterwards, big Afro jeans, t-shirt, and she, I said, uh, Congresswoman Chisholm, I have a class. I'm about to flunk because I'm not going to work in any of their campaigns, those white guys' campaigns. But I love what you're saying. She spoke fluent Spanish. She talked about immigrant rights. She talked about ending poverty. She talked about ending the Vietnam War. I mean, she was like unbelievable as a progressive black member of Congress. She was bold. She was visionary. I said, you know, Oh, maybe I'll think about trying to pass this class, what I do. She said, first of all, little girl, and you know, by then I was in my early 20s, she said, you've got to register to vote. I said, no. I said, that's petty bourgeoisie. I don't do that. I'm a revolutionary. <laughs> I said, I don't do that. I just want to pass this class. <laughs> yeah. Ain't it somehow history just recycles itself? You know? I said, no, no, no. So she took me to task and she said, look, if you want to change this country and the world, if you really believe in what you're talking about, if you want that mm. systemic change, if you care about ending racism and sexism, and, and she talked about everything. She said, then you've got to participate in this. She said, you've got to get involved. 
She said, you can't sit on the sidelines and whine. She said, she says, and I understand what you're doing with the Black Panther Party, because I ended up helping her come to where she endorsed, uh, the Black Panther Party endorsed wow. Shirley Chisholm wow. when she ran. And I was very part of that wow. advice. So she said, if you really believe that, keep working with the party, keep doing BSU, but you gotta study and make good grades, and you've gotta get involved. So okay, so I went back, talked to my professor, I said, okay, what'd I do? Because I asked Shirley, and she said, well, I leave it up to my local people, because I don't have a lot of money in campaigns, so it's an organic kind of campaign. So I talked to my professor, asked her what to do. She said, well, you gotta figure that out, that's part of the class. <laughs> I said, no. So I went to my good friend, who later became Ron Dellum's chief of staff, and mine, Sandre Swanson. Sandre Swanson. Went to Sandre, who was Another at Laney legend. College. Yes. He was the student body president at Laney. Went to Sandy Gaines, who was the student body president at Mills College. We all got together. We ended up organizing the Northern California Shirley Chisholm campaign wow. out of my class at Mills College. Wow. Shirley writes about this in chapter six in her book, The Good Fight. We took nine or 10 percent of the vote in Alameda County. Wow. I went on to Miami as a Shirley Chisholm delegate, and I got an A in the class. So that was my real beginning of electoral politics. OK? And it was during that time that I met Ron Delms in the early 70s who saw something in me that, I mean, I didn't know what he saw in me. Really? <laughs> he didn't, he, you don't know what he saw? I had no clue here. I'm just struggling, revolutionary, trying to raise these two kids on welfare, trying to start a mental health center the whole nine you years. You almost flipped the world upside down <laughs> in your first 20 years of life. I don't know what you saw in you, but man, no, amazing. Yeah, and so I said, you know what? By the time I finished my bachelor's at Mills, I went to Cal. And I wanted to uh, be a Cal in the Capitol intern. I said, now how am I going to do this? First of all, with two little boys, I'm on welfare. I got a little house, then their HUD had a 235 program where, where people on public assistance could buy a house. Really? I bought a house in Maxwell Park on Birdsaw for $19,000. Wow. We got to bring that program back. We got to bring it back. That's why I work so hard every day to deal with this affordable housing crisis, because I know I know what it means to be able to buy a house if you don't have a lot of money just to get in and start building equity. That's the only way I ended up taking care of my kids, sending them to school. Wow. So I had bought, and so I said, what am I gonna do? This was between my first and second year. I said, Ron, when I got to know Ron, I really wanted to be an intern. So Ron said, okay. He said, but you know, Cal has to figure that out because you have to be a Cal in the Capital intern so you can get paid because they paid a dollar an hour <laughs> to be an intern. My Lord. So here I'm trying to figure out what to do. So I went up to the university. I applied. And you know, by then, I don't know if they ever had any black students. I've got to check this out as a Cal the Capital intern because that meant you had to shut down everything and none of us had any money. Go to Washington, D.C., know the member of Congress, and try to get in so you could be that intern. Well, somehow, my thank God, because of the grace of God and my family, they took my children for the summer. I shut my house down. Wow. I fought like crazy to be a county capital intern. I went on to Washington, D.C., and I worked for three months for a dollar an hour as a county capital intern in Ron's office. And this was during the Watergate era when I saw the Nixon helicopter leave the White House. Okay, believe you me, this is worse now than it was then. Wow. <laughs> and so Ron mentored me. He encouraged me. He always said he was a... Then, when I left, he said, Bob, would you come back, call me, Bob, come back and head up my office? I said, me? I'm, which I was, I have a mental health center by now in, in uh, Cal. In my second year, I wanted to start a community mental health center here in Berkeley, because the stuff I was dealing with as a psychiatric social work intern wasn't relevant for black clients. So I started my own center, mind you, <laughs> when I was in school, called Change Incorporated. I started my own, it was right on Sacramento Avenue, 2880 Sacramento. So I said, Ron, I'm not sure. And everyone said, are you crazy? You're not going to go back and work for Ron Dellums? I said, well, I got this mental health center, and I really am clear on why I want black people in my district in uh, Berkeley to have some relevant mental health services. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I developed my own model, raised my own money, you know, got 150 grand, and we, as a student, mind you, as a student. 
So I was not sure not, I wanted. Y'all not working hard enough. I just want to let you know. All right. we'll, we'll put a pin in that. When Congresswoman Lee, we gonna come back. So I was somebody taking notes. Okay, as a student, I did that. Finally, everybody convinced me, including my family, I need to go to to D.C. because I was seeing a lot of, as we see today, stress, depression, yes. acting out so many issues in our community but they're directly related to policies and laws that mm. oppress people yes you know the funding priorities not enough daycare unemployment no uh real living wage i saw women who were just on the streets because they couldn't take care of their kids you know i mean and i was dealing with i was a good psychoanalytic psychotherapist that was my my background mm. and so i knew it was the policies Okay, and I knew it was the system that was causing all of this despair. So Ron said, you can deal, Ron was a social worker, a psychiatric mm. social worker too. He said, Bob, you can deal with this as a chief of staff and a congressperson, as a staffer, because you can help me deal with policies mm. that will turn this around. So I worked for Ron for 11 years, both wow. in uh, DC and here in the district. Ron always called himself a feminist, which he was. Mm. There were, I think there were two African-American women chief of staffs when I went back to work for Ron in 1975, too. There were very few African-Americans at all on Capitol Hill or people of color at all. And so Ron trusted me. He said, look, you, you know more than what these other guys know. He said, because you have a background and a history that you're bringing to Capitol Hill that is badly needed. So he trusted me to run his office. Mm. And he trusted me to hire his staff and help him set his agenda. And he empowered me. So I say he lived up to the fact that he was a true feminist because he always had women in key staff positions, women of color and people of color yes. in his office. He always, where's Eliza? She's here in my, where is, where is uh, Eliza? There, Eliza's an intern in my office stand up, now. Eliza, so so Elijah, stand, stand, stand up, because I'm, I'm thinking about Yay. you. And yeah. I say, be careful what you ask for, right? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> She's doing a wonderful job. Now, and now, so that's how I got to here. We, we, we. Uh, I could talk to you all day, and I know you got a, you got another appointment you got to get to. But let let me let me just a ask ask you a couple things pertaining to to the moment we're in now. We were having a conversation about the importance of an intergenerational relationship between folks like yourself who have all this history, yeah. right? Like, you know, I'm 42, what am I, 42? <laughs> and so I do see myself as living in the middle between, you know, some of my elders who are ahead of me and some of our next kind of millennial generation. And there is a thirst I find with a lot of millennials to be in relationship with our elders who have this wisdom. Can you just talk a little bit about um, the commitments you think we need to make in order to really bridge that? Because there are forces that are trying to keep our elders, whether they're in churches or political spaces or communal spaces, and our younger folks who may be in some of these similar parallel spaces at odds with each other. And I remember when in our conversation, you really had a passion for that, which actually precipitated you coming here. You said maybe this could be a first step of us sharing this wisdom, but also building a bridge. Sure, and I think it's extremely important. Let me just say, uh, I'm running for Democratic Caucus chair, right? Touch There's so never, man. let me. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now t tell us uh, what Let me is. tell you what yeah, I'm doing. Yeah. That's the, the head of the, all the Democrats. You have, that's the third highest position, I think it's fourth highest position, depending on how we organize in Congress. You'd have the speaker, then you had the majority leader or whip, and then you'd have Dem Caucus chair. There's never been in the whole history of Congress in what, 233, 234 years, an African-American woman in leadership. Ever, ever, ever. That okay. sounds like, that sound like something you need, you, yeah. you used to breaking up. Yeah, but let me tell you, but let me tell you what they're saying. Oh, she doesn't reflect intergenerational change. And I'm saying, what the heck are you talking about? First of all, it's about ideas, it's about experience, it's about being able to, to make sure that the future is secure with younger and newer members. But I'm really dealing with a lot of that right now because a lot of the younger, non-African, not when you look at African-American members in Congress, because of our history and what we've had to go through because of the lack of voting rights, money and all that, there are only four black women under 60 years of age and we have 20 
one members of the Black Caucus who are women. And so what you do is, so the intergenerational piece is playing out on the Hill, but we have to really understand what that means let's, if you're let's, African American. Let's pause American. there, because you, uh -huh. you gave me an explanation for that that I just did not know that often, particularly black women, when they're running for office, they have to do it later in life because... We're raising, because of me, what I just shared with you. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know? this is important history, because there's privilege in politics that that most folk don't even attend to, and even some of our well-meaning progressive folk who are, you know, white folk, I found are oblivious to the ways in which their own privilege and blind spots actually re-instruct or construct oppression on folks they claim to be allies with. And so this, this story is important for all of us because all of us have some blind spots and if we're not attending to that, we'll, we'll think we're advocating for equity and we're actually yeah. re-inscribing oppression. So just, yeah. just take a moment and just give us a little bit of that, sure. the reason. Sure, and African American women, mind you, are the reason Democrats win. Mm. Okay, so we're the backbone, the most loyal and consistent voters in the Democratic Party. And so when we talk about intergenerational issues, which everyone knows, I am about the future. I am about making sure that we, because when I was elected to Congress, when I announced, Ron Dellums passed me a, literally, a blue baton. Mm. And so it's my job as a leader to work with our younger people and pass that baton to them. Amen. But they've got to have that experience and knowledge and know what the deal is, because this is a rough system. Okay, and so mentoring, I mean, I have so many young people who have come in and out of my office and who are doing great things. It is extremely important that we work together on an intergenerational basis and on an intersectional basis, yes. okay? Because this area is, prides itself on coalition politics. Ron Dellums was the father of coalition politics. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that poor people, people of color, low-income people, people who've been marginalized and shut out have to come together, mm -hmm. regardless of age, so that we can move forward and institute the systemic and institutional change that's required in this country if we're really going to make any significant progress. Clap it up for okay? that, everybody. That is so important. That is so important. And so, so we, we are approaching, you know, it's so funny because I usually say this next election is the most important election you've ever participated in. And now I really, I'm not saying I didn't believe it before, but <laughs> good Lord. Tell us why this election is so important. What is at stake as you, and again, I, what, what's so fascinating about this conversation for me is I'm pretty engaged and I'm learning things, particularly this housing program you mentioned where people in public assistance could get access to how buying, not just living in a house, but, but buying a home. These kinds of policies are policies we have to resurrect. We have to have a policy agenda to resurrect that, but if we're not participating in the electoral process from you know, uh, local levels all the way up. We don't have a pipeline of radical policymakers. Talk about the importance of this next election. It's, it's, it's in several months and we know what's at stake. I'd love to hear from you as someone who's in DC. What is at stake? And, and again, we, I believe, we, you know, you among folks who believe that this administration is full of the devil. Amen, so, so, and I mean that. We gotta exercise, but maybe our exorcism strategy is voting. You don't gotta be, you, don't, you can no. be like, I don't know no. what Pastor was talking about. No, 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 I, was I go. A, I was a visitor, but no. I, you full of the devil, dog. No, you Pastor Mike, yeah. I go to the book of James, faith without works is dead, tell right? Tell your name. <laughs> oh, so, t tell us about Allen Temple. So you're, you've been a long time member yeah, of Allen Temple. Yeah, I've been Temple. a member of Allen Temple since the early 80s. Early 80s. Early 80s, early 80s. Yes, 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 yes. Pastor Smith Emeritus and Pastor Smith Jr. Both are my pastors, and I tell you, that is a phenomenal church. Mm -hmm. I really have been that's been really my spiritual home mm -hmm. for many many years because it's a church that's very active in the community and really understands the moment we're in yes. in terms of social justice also let me okay going to this election let me just mention one more thing about that uh, housing program yes okay because equity in one's home is the primary way to achieve this American dream it used to be okay we don't, we're not, we, we're not playing on the Wall Street or the stock market. You know, the only way we can really acquire some wealth is through equity in one's own. A lot of people don't know this about me, uh, but I had a business after I left Ron's staff for 11 years. 
And uh, it was because of it. I had 350, 400 employees, a facilities management company. I was a Teamster union contractor right here in Oakland, had an office in DC, Kansas City, here all over the country, okay? And I employed a lot of people at a living wage with benefits. And I wanted to do that because I wanted to see if I could do it first of all, and I did it. But it was only because of the equity in that first house in Maxwell Park so that I was the, able to do it. You used the equity from your home to help you launch this business? Yeah, yeah. It was an $11 million business when I divested and sold it in 98. Touch your that's right. Okay, so that's why housing is so important. Affordable housing, equity in one's home, that's what it's about. I, got I sure did. It. it was called Lee Associates. A lot of people around here work for me. Okay? So, can, can y'all listen to her all day? I mean, this no, is... No, I'm just this is, I got some. <laughs> <laughs> so this election, it is. Because these policies that I'm talking about that help me, of course we don't need to reinstitute them as they were, but we need to not go back. Yes. We need a legislative and funding agenda to move forward. And the, it's been already shown that the people who didn't vote elected Donald Trump. Mm. And now what do we have? We have a White House that's turning the back, their backs, their, the clock back on voting rights, yes. on women's rights, yes. on racial equity, yes. on the uh, environmental gains that we made, on climate change. Look at what they're doing now with these uh, power plants. I mean, I, El Paso, Texas, half my family and, and student kids I grew up with are dead in their 30s and 40s because we had a smelter right in our community mm. that killed everybody or they have debilitating diseases now. Mm. Okay, so I know that. This administration's rolling back everything we did on clean air under the Obama administration. This administration is rolling back everything in terms of public education. They're trying to privatize public yeah. schools. Yeah. They're privatizing everything. They're increasing the military budget, taking away resources, and I'm an appropriator. I'm the only black woman on the Appropriations Committee. Explain, explain just real quick. And the Appropriations Committee is the committee that determines how much money will go to all of the federal government. So I'm on the subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services, which funds education, mm. health care, mm. Department of Labor. Mm. I'm on that subcommittee, and we carve up the budget. And so I have to look out for the entire country in terms of low-income communities, HBCUs, yeah. community colleges. That comes within my jurisdiction. Okay. And, and you're head of the Poverty Caucus? or The, the, po the 100 members, it's the Task Force on Poverty, Inequality, and Opportunity. Mm. So I'm trying to lift everybody's, the consciousness of Democrats on the issues of poverty. Yes. Because they don't talk about poor people or low income individuals, they just talk about which we care about and want the middle class to thrive and survive and we don't want any more people falling into the ranks of poor, but we got, can't forget that there are a lot of poor people, That's right. a lot of low income people in this country and we have as Democrats to focus on that. So this election, okay, is all about that and more because when we take back the house in November, yeah. okay, you all have to help us. There are about eight seats in California that you can help us with, okay? We have to have that system, of, which is in this government, even though you don't know it, system of checks and balances restored. Yeah. Because now this is, is in many ways an authoritarian regime. Mm. The lines are blurred between the judiciary, the executive branch, and the legislative branch. You have no checks and balances. This administration is running rampant, and so we have to have that wall of resistance. Because mm -hmm. we can stop a lot of this bad stuff. Amen. We can stop a lot of it dead in its tracks if you help us take back the House. So what, what do you need from us? I mean, you know, I, I always say that we are a voting congregation you know, I, I, don't, I don't say that your salvation is in peril if you don't vote. But uh, I, I want you, <laughs> listen, I want you to, I want us to be a 100% voting congregation, right? So, what, knowing all these many years, what would you say to, th this is a room full of followers of Jesus, of justice, of mercy, of faith. What would you say to us as our congresswoman, the, the person that 
we have sent back and forth to DC for the last 20 years. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a younger room, I, I will say. You know, what, what would you want us to know about the importance of this moment? What, what do you need from us in this moment? As you know, I am a follower of the way myself. And so, so this has got to be part of our ministry. Yes. It's got to be part of our ministry. First of all, we have many elections taking place in the East Bay. Decide who you want to vote for, what propositions on the ballot you may, what initiatives you want to vote for, get to the, those campaigns and work for them. Yeah. If you want to help us, I mean, what I'm doing, of course, I'm running and mm -hmm. I've got a Green Party candidate, so we're going, I, I always, for the last few elections, I've had the highest voter turnout and percentage in the entire state, Democrat or Republican member of Congress. Mm -hmm. But that's because of y'all, you have helped do that. So we've got to have a large turnout here in my district in November. Beyond that, we have Indivisible. We have lots of organizations who we're working with, in candi with candidates in the Central Valley and in Los Angeles. We have about eight candidates who will, could win. They're very close to winning. If we get down there and help get out the vote, do phone banking, do whatever you can do, we'll have even phone banking from my district into those districts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So volunteer. There's a heck of a lot to do. Don't think that one person can't make a difference. I mean, one person can make a difference, okay? And so you can make a difference, you can make a difference, all of you all. You got to get engaged because the future really is at stake. When you're talking about this Trump administration and what they're rolling back, they're taking us back to the days of before Jim Crow. You saw Charlottesville. I hope you see Black Klansmen. Uh, I grew up with Ronnie Stewart, incidentally, the Black Klansman. He lived two doors up from us in El Paso, Texas. I know Ronnie very well. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, it's very important. The future, these young people, you, your future's at stake. And, and coming from me, who, who still is someone who's an agitator, okay, who's a movement person, who believes in the pressure of the outside, who believes in mobilization so that the inside, your electeds can do their job, your, your role is so important, not only at elections, but in between elections to hold us all accountable yes. to who we are as a community and as a people. So thank you again. Don't relieve, don't relieve.